Well, hello everyone. This is the Chapter 7 video for our Instrument Ground School. So today I want to start by talking about IFR system. So Chapter 7 is all about the IFR system and how does it work. So IFR system and really a lot of the things like ATC grew out of a need. They had a need in order to deal with bad weather and still be able to fly in order to deal with higher volumes of traffic, especially in bad weather. So ATC actually got started in 1935 when four of the airlines got together and they decided to have some way of controlling traffic in and out of Newark. So, you know, Newark has been a problem airport for a really long time. I guess that's the moral to that story. So they started out by having some controllers there. Uh, over time, eventually the government took over air traffic control. And that's what we have today. Today we have, uh, we have towers, of course, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, we also have some airports have approach departure control, and then we have air traffic control centers, or sometimes called air route traffic control centers, or ARTCCs. So what are those? There's 21 of them. They kind of control the airspace, usually above a certain altitude, uh, typically 6,000 MSL and above, sometimes a little bit higher than that, depending on what's below them. And they will help you out when you're between towers or some other air traffic control facility. So here in Bloomsburg, our local center is York. And there are some other centers that you might fly into. If you fly toward the east, you might get into Boston. Uh, if you fly to the west, you can get into Cleveland Center. And if you go south, you might get into the Washington Center. And we haven't talked about charts yet, but eventually we'll get there. We'll talk about charts and we'll show you how different regions on instrument charts will show you who is your center, your ARTCC. Now your book, they show you pictures like radar displays. They talk a little bit about radar. We have primary radar, where a radar hits your aircraft and it bounces back and you get a little blip on a screen. To that we supplement, and we supplement with things like mode C. So mode C sends your altitude. There's mode A, which sends just the code that's on your transponder, which of course if you're flying VFR and don't have a code is normally 1200. So that's sometimes called a 4096 transponder. It's because it has 4096 possible codes. It's actually an octal system. You have the numbers 0 through 7, which are available. And as I said, mode C is where you send your altitude. Then there's mode S. Mode S is a selective send where you can actually query a transponder. That is something that can be used for ABSB. Now, we haven't talked a lot about ABSB just yet. Uh, you probably already know this. ABSB, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, is a way for communications to occur between aircraft. It also helps aircraft in areas where there's bad radar coverage. This is actually something that was pioneered in Alaska. And it's part of something called free flight, where eventually we'll have a lot less where we're dealing with human controllers and a little bit more of airplanes kind of negotiating between themselves. That's uh, transponders, um, and they send signals on 1090 megahertz. So sometimes you'll hear about a 1090 ES or an extended squitter. That is a signal that's sent possibly as part of an ADSB transmission. Now, your book talks a lot about things like weather minimums and VFR weather minimums. 
And here's the thing to know about that. VFR weather minimums are all about keeping VFR traffic out of your way when the weather is bad. And that's really all the reason that they exist. Things like Class E airspace exist pretty much for that express purpose of getting rid of those pesky VFR guys when you don't want to deal with them. Some other things that Rod talks about in this chapter, he talks about the ATC system, talks about ASR, which is a surveillance radar, airport surveillance radar. This can be used at some airports in order to do an approach where they pretty much will see you on radar and then tell you what to do. There are a few airports, normally military airports, that also have precision approach radar or PAR, which can be used for a precision radar approach. Basically, precision, as we learned before, just means that it has a glide slope. So their radar can also give you altitudes, not just your horizontal information. So it's pretty cool. That should not be confused with something called a no gyro approach. A no gyro approach is something you fly where you pretty much are on radar and they tell you to turn and then to stop turning and they kind of guide you in. Essentially, they're going to vector you to the airport. This is something you could do if you didn't have any gyros. You know, everything failed, you're having a really bad day. That is a no gyro approach. And again, not to be confused with an ASR or a PAR approach. It's kind of a different thing. One thing you should know, if you ever are doing a no gyro approach, you're expected to make half standard rate turns because it takes a little while for your course change to show up on the radar. So it's not very easy for them if you were, if you were turning at the normal rate. Then Rod talks about filing an IFR flight plan. So why do you do this? How does this work? Normally you would fly, file a flight plan with flight service. Now, of course, you can call 1-800-WX-BRIEF and do this. Almost nobody does that today. Most people are going to use software to do this. Um, but again, you could, in theory, do that. And that gets put in the system. You don't normally have to file a half hour before you go anywhere. That gives that time, the system time to kind of let this percolate through. Now, if you're departing IFR from a towered field or a non-towered field, it's a very different thing. So we'll start with a towered field just like Rod does. If you're departing from a towered field, you would do the normal stuff. You know, maybe they have clearance delivery, maybe they don't. So you would call them up and say, hey, you know, let's let's say they don't have clearance delivery. You're calling up ground control, you tell them you're ready to taxi, and you can tell them, hey, I'm IFR to this destination and they're going to give you your clearance back. Now it might be a different clearance from the one that you filed, a different routing and things like that and there's different reasons why that can happen. But, okay so the first thing you should know when you have a clearance and you're going to have it read back to you, you can use this little aid, craft. So whether it's ground control or clearance delivery, it doesn't matter. But they're going to give you your clearance, and it's going to go something like this. Cessna 8100 Charlie Fox is cleared to, and then the place that you're cleared to is your clearance limit. So what is that limit? Well, it could be your destination if it's close. But let's say I'm going to go on a thousand mile trip. They're not going to clear me to my destination. They're going to clear me to some intermediate fix. So that's the first thing. You're cleared to your clearance limit. And then the next thing is R, your route. Now, if you're really lucky and you did your homework on common routes, preferred routes to your 
from where you are to your destination, you might get cleared as filed, or you might get cleared as filed except, and then they tell you a whole bunch of changes. So this route might be you know, direct to this fix, and then from there, some Victor Airway, and then some other fix, and et cetera, et cetera. Right? So some sort of routing is gonna be next. Then they're gonna give you your altitude. Your altitude will commonly be something like this. Uh, maybe there's an initial fix. It'll say climb and maintain uh, 3,000. Expect 6,000 five minutes after departure. Very common thing where they'll initially clear you to a lower altitude and then they'll later give you a higher altitude. You know, maybe I'm going up to the flight levels. Maybe I'm flying to Malibu. And I'm going up to flight level 250. They're not going to clear me all the way up to flight level 250 right away. They're going to give me an intermediate altitude. Then they're going to give me a frequency. That's my departure frequency, typically. And then my transponder code. You might have seen this already in your private pilot ground school because guess what? Even if you're flying VFR out of certain airports, they're going to give you a clearance that's very similar. It's not going to have all these fixes and things, but it'll probably be, you know, fly runway heading, maintain VFR at or below this altitude, blah, 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 blah. All right. So that's the difference between IFR and VFR from a busy tower field. I'm on the ramp, I called up ground or clearance delivery, got my clearance, I read it back to them. If I'm talking to ground control, they'll typically say advise ready to taxi. I call them up, say I'm ready to taxi now, taxi out to the runway, I get to the end of the runway, I do my run up, and I pull up to the old short line, and now what? Now I call the tower. When I call the tower and tell them I'm ready to go, you might hear, hold short, awaiting lease. What does that mean? That means that your instrument flight plan is in the system, but they need to talk to the other controllers. If it's a tower, maybe they have to talk to departure control, maybe they have to talk to a center. It really depends on where you're going. And they essentially need to tell them, hey, this person is going to leave. Can you fit them into the system right now? You know, are you departing about the time that you said you would depart? Are you late? Are you early? You know, that can mess things up for a little bit. So you'll be told to hold short, waiting release, pretty common thing to hear here. And then once they release you, they'll tell you to take off. You just take off and you do all the normal stuff. As soon as the tower tells you, you contact departure on the frequency that you already knew, and you talk to them, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to go into all of the uh, radio communications just yet. But. Okay, so that's from a towered field. What about a non-towered field? Well, here's where life gets a little bit different. At a non-towered field, same thing. You file your instrument flight plan, and then you go, and you get ready. You get to the end of the runway. Now, you want to call somebody. Well, how are you going to call them? Well, you can call them on the radio. That's certainly possible. But today, more commonly, you're going to call them on the phone. So you're going to get out your phone, and you're going to call them. And if you look, like here in Bloomsburg, we have a number where you essentially can call Wilkes-Barre directly. And you can call them up and say, hey, I'm the pilot of 819 Charlie Foxtrot on the ground, ready to go to Bloomsburg, want to pick up my IFR clearance. And they're going to give you essentially the same kind of stuff that you would have gotten here at the Towered Field with one difference. And that difference is they're going to ask you when they're done, telling you your clearance, are you ready to go? And you'll hopefully say yes, otherwise you shouldn't be calling them. And then they will give you a departure window. You might say, well, what's up with that? It's typically 10 minutes. We'll say, you know, you have to depart within 10 minutes. 
or normally this time, this is the time now. If you're not off by then, your clearance is void and you should contact this person, right? On this frequency, whoever. So then you can call them as soon as you get in the air, everything's good, right? So call them when you're ready. Long time ago, this long time ago, uh, in 2001, where we had some troubles, where they grounded everybody for a while, they came up with this rule. They said you couldn't do any pop-up IFRs. So that's another option. If you can depart VFR, you can actually get your clearance in the air. It's not as desirable, but it is possible in VFR conditions. At that time, because of September 11th, they actually had halted that. So I remember one time being in an airport and nobody had a cell phone and there wasn't a number to call back then. And taxiing around, trying to find the sweet spot on this airport where someone would actually answer the radio if we called them. And I don't even know how long we spent taxiing around trying to get our instrument clearance so we could just take off. So that's something that hopefully is a thing of the past where you don't have to worry about that so much anymore. Okay, uh, your book does talk a little bit about TECs, tower in route control. Uh, this is not something you're gonna encounter in this area uh, if you're gonna fly in California and other really busy places where you got tons of towered fields packed together. I'd say, you know, give that a read, but honestly, for the majority of pilots out there, this is something that they'll never ever deal with. You're much more likely in this area to have to deal with the Washington DC airspace than you are to deal with a TEC kind of situation. Other things, uh, Rod talks about preferred routes. Preferred routes are standard ways to go from busy airport A to busy airport B. So these are the routes that you probably should use. You know, if you try to go direct everywhere, uh, you know, especially if you want to go direct to a airport that is hundreds of miles away, it, nobody is going to know what that destination is, and they're probably going to give you something different. They're going to add some fixes that the local controllers know about to your path. So you just make everyone's life easier and add those yourself. So those are preferred routes. Now, back in the day when there was the big red book, or sorry, the green book called the Airport Facilities Directory, you could look in there and find preferred routes. That has kind of gone away. It's been replaced with the electronic supplement for your charts, uh, but you can still find that information today. So that is a little bit about the IFR system. And that is pretty much chapter seven.